Welcome to the One Big Thing Podcast, where inspiration meets transformation. I'm in a new job. It's overwhelming. I'm not sure how to be successful. There's a lot of pressure on. I have some go-to strategies that I use time and time and time again that have been very effective. And they've allowed me to feel confident to tackle new opportunities and new jobs and new strategies. And I wanted to be challenged. And I knew that there was going to be a struggle in that challenge. And I knew that there was going to be some hardship in that challenge, but I really felt like that was important for me as a human to be able to give back to the world around me. Well, welcome back to the One Big Thing podcast. I am your host, Steve Campbell. Um, If you're brand new to the One Big Thing podcast, if this is your first stop because you are here to champion Dr. Thompson today, who is my guest on this show, welcome to the One Big Thing. Um, I hope that this isn't your last stop, uh, but that Dr. Thompson's story will inspire and encourage you to not only move the ball forward, but maybe check out some of the other incredible guests that I've had on this show. And the One Big Thing is all about bringing you really just people from all walks of life that are doing incredible things that don't always have it figured out. They make a lot of mistakes, but they're willing to share from the things that they've done wrong, what they've learned from it, the life lessons that can help you understand that you're not alone, that life is worth living, and we all get one shot at this thing. So how do we make the most of it? Um, So I'm excited about Dr. Thompson today. Um, She was actually a referral in an introduction uh, from Allison Minatulo. Uh, If you missed her episode, go back and champion her. Uh, She just talked about her life growing up in business using running as an analogy for what she learned about how to push herself. And I ask every guest at the end of our recording, one, how their experience was, because I want them to feel honored and appreciated, but also like, hey, who do you know that I should know? Or who do you know that I should interview? And Dr. Thompson came by way of Allison. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, Thank you, Allison. You're amazing. And congratulations on your new book, by the way, for your kid's book. You guys should check that out too. Um, Dr. Thompson, welcome to the One Big Thing podcast. For those that may not know you, do you want to give us just a very you know high level overview at the beginning here of kind of who you are? Oh, Steve, thank you so much. And agree with your shout out about Allison. I'm going to take inspiration from Allison uh, relevant to running. So thank you. Thank you for being uh, a guest today is incredibly special. So I'm Suzanne Thompson, and I serve as the president of Moreland University, which is an incredible honor. This is actually my 33rd year in education. Uh, I've worked in both public education in the state of Pennsylvania. I've worked in the ed tech industry. I've worked in the higher education space. So I think of myself as an educator, and I have been incredibly fortunate to learn from so many amazing people over the course of my lifetime and my career. I've also had the opportunity to change jobs a lot and tackle new adventures and do some cool things. And oftentimes those were things that I didn't have any background or I didn't have any experience or I didn't have any expertise. So I'm excited to share my experience today and talk with you. And uh, I appreciate being here. This is super fun. Yeah, in an early congratulations, I think you might be my first educator on the One Big Thing <gasps> podcast. Uh, so this wow. is like a this is like a hooray. Uh, if you're like, well, what does that mean? Um, I source guests from literally all walks of life. If you are brand new to the show, I've had everybody from my Peloton instructors to musicians that I've reached out to to influencers of all walks of life, uh, but nobody in the world of education. And my goal with this show is to source enough diversity of guests, um, diversity of you know different. Um, backgrounds, different ages, because I think perspective is key. And I think people are always looking for what are those wisdom? What are those nuggets that I can take from somebody else's story? Because we can always learn from other people that maybe I can contextualize to my own life. And maybe I, mm-hmm. I, I've i never been an educator. Maybe I've never gone through education. If you guys missed my last episode, I had Holly Francis, who is a survivor of a rare disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Mm. Her episode was phenomenal. She talked about this disease that affected her that she never asked for right after having her first baby. 
baby and just now she's the mm. face of this she's the face of this rare disease you might have listened to that yeah. entire episode and said man i've never been through anything like that with suzanne today you may never been in education but i think her story can resonate just like any one of my guests there's always something that you can take from these episodes because we're all human beings we're all trying to figure out this thing called life so we didn't just get to where we are as the president of a university well respected adored love by people like allison and now getting to know you i'm, I'm already in love so this is good today why don't you take us back as far kind of as we need to go to kind of catch us up what's this journey been like how did we get to where we are today oh it's such a great question and i'm crazy honored to be your first educator i will say that being in the field of education has been such such an amazing career experience it's an amazing industry it's vast it's all about people connection it's about supporting each other so i'm a huge advocate of the industry and would encourage all your listeners to get curious and get excited about thinking about a, a career path or a role or some way they can contribute to education in their own local community or in their in their own area so i you know most of us went through k12 education I, I had a great experience in K-12 education, and I had those teachers who were so profound, and they were so interesting, and they were so compelling, and I loved the way they made me feel in my heart. I loved the way they turned my brain on fire, and I understood that those amazing teachers were doing something fundamentally important about helping me become a better and stronger and more capable human being. And when I got to college, I was like, I have more of these amazing people. They're my faculty colleagues in my that are teaching me in these classes. And I thought, maybe like many of us at 17 or 18 years old, what the heck are we going to do with our life? Like, what are we going to do? What job are we going to do? And I realized I had so much respect and so much excitement and I got caught on fire and was inspired when I was around amazing teachers. So I thought, hey, maybe I should give that a try. Maybe I should try being a teacher. And my senior year of college, I was student teaching and I remember being in a classroom of second graders and I loved seeing their little eyes light up. I loved seeing them feel like a part of something that valued them. I loved mm -hmm. seeing them being cared for. I loved seeing these children feel like they could do anything, whether it was learn their addition facts or recite the alphabet or sing a song or talk to each other. I was so inspired by the idea of people learning together and collaborating together and helping each other solve problems that that really inspired me to want to be in the field of helping people learn, whether it was learning a curriculum like a, a, a high school biology curriculum or learning your middle school, you know, algebra one class, or what I got really excited about was helping the adults in my environment learn and helping them feel competent and competent at the work they do. So after teaching in the elementary school years for a lot of years, which was absolutely fascinating, I also really valued those connections with adults. I valued when a colleague in a grade level or a colleague in a classroom next to me would struggle, I was like, hey, let's put our heads together. I bet we can figure that out. I really believed in the power of people putting their heads together and that when we do that, we're able to champion almost anything. So that led me into thinking, hmm, maybe I should be a principal. Maybe I should be an instructional coach. Maybe I should be an educational consultant. And that led me on a pathway, Steve, to you know moving from classroom teaching to being an educational consultant, working in regional service units um, in Pennsylvania, to being back in school districts, to being an assistant principal and supporting teachers and parents. I love supporting parents. I think that it is such a mystery that child arrives in your life and there is no instruction manual. And then they go to school and they're learning things and they're away from you. And I loved being able to engage with parents and help them support their, their journey as a parent of a child in the school system. 
you know, that led me to being a director of curriculum and instruction. That led me to being a superintendent of schools. That led me to work in the ed tech industry and working in professional development and working for big companies and doing work both domestically and globally, working with systems, working with schools, working with people in for-profit business environments that said, how can we give back to schools? How can we help foster children in our communities? And it, um, you know, finally led me here to Moreland University, but I've had so many incredible job opportunities all the way. But the one thread that is very consistent through all that is I feel fundamentally at my core that people working together and helping support each other to solve problems or seek solutions is always going to be a pathway where we help each other, we learn, and we continue to get better and better as a human race. And uh, that's why I love being in education, because it's about people and connecting with people and helping them feel like they have a knowledge or they have a skill set. They have a way that they can bring something to their life that makes them feel good about their life and makes them feel successful. It makes them feel capable. And whether that's a successful mom or a successful you know, plumber or a successful musician or a successful dad or a successful uncle or just successful at like getting the laundry done. Um, I love the idea of helping people feel good about themselves and feel like they can be a really strong, positive force for good in our world. Let's take a quick break to hear a word from your sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Seed Planning Group. If you're looking for a life-giving experience working with a financial planner, then Seed is here for you. Seed is a fee-only financial planning firm with a fiduciary obligation to put your best interests first. If your goal is financial freedom and independence without sales, products, or really glorified salespeople, then check out Seed Planning Group today. You can visit www.seedpg.com. That's www.seedpg.com. And the best part, you can schedule a free consultation to find out if their fee-only planners and their process are right for you. Yeah. So fun fact, uh, we didn't talk about this before we came on, but I don't know if you knew this, but I actually have a master's in education as a social study teacher from the state of New York, uh, seven through 12. Um, I thought growing up that I was going to be a teacher much of because of what you just described. I remember meeting with my guidance counselor in uh, high school and thinking I have way too much personality to do a nine to five in a cubicle. Like what, what can I go do that would allow me to be my larger than life personality to be a clown. And so in what you talked about, I could totally see you as a, as a teacher. And if you're wondering, Hey, Do I just have to listen to this? Folks, you do not. You can also head over to YouTube uh, to our channel, NQR Media, which stands for Not Quite Right Media. This is where we host our four different podcasts that NQR produces, and you can watch all of these interviews uh, and see us interacting. So if you see Suzanne, you totally like fit the vibe of a teacher, you have the heart of a teacher. And I love what you shared because as a dad to four young kids, uh, for those Uh of your, you know, fans that are following, um, I have a, a, an eight-year-old son, a six-year-old son, and then identical twin girls that are three and are going to be four here in April. Uh, Life is wild right now. And I will tell you that from uh, being involved in our local schools to our church, understanding as a parent that the one thing that I will say is uh, no matter what we may be doing right or wrong, my wife and I as you know, parents in our own home, one thing I do know is that my kids love and respect authority figures and nothing makes me more happy as a dad than seeing the way that you would think the way my boys talk about their school teachers, you know, they talk about them in such a light and such a reverence and how much they love them and when they're acknowledged by them. And, you know, I, I know that teachers play such a pivotal role. I have a brother that is a, a gym coach and he's been a, a coach on the football field uh, in wrestling for years. I had a sister-in-law who is now staying home, but was involved in schools. I've also mentioned before that my middle brother is a musician and for the last decade has developed an anti-bullying music show that he does all wow. over the, all over the country for elementary, middle and high schools. And when he goes into these schools, you know, he has kids that are going through real life situations. They come in with their arms crossed, kind of wondering who is this guy? I don't want to be in this, you know, presentation today. And three, four songs in as my brother makes a human connection, sing songs that are impassioned. Mm-hmm. You know, these kids' walls come down and they melt. And mm-hmm. what you realize is that kids, just like us as humans, 
we all have the same desires. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want somebody to recognize us, show us value. And I think as a teacher, you you have such an opportunity for kids that may be neglected at home, might be neglected mm-hmm. by other people. And to just speak life, to just you know uh, share how encouraged you are by their work. You, I remember some of my school teachers growing up. You can really, really shape life in a way. But I think, I think what's cool about your story um, is there's, you know, for me, I'm 37 years old. I'm growing up in an age of technology. I'm growing up in age of social media. You know, there's a lot of our listeners that are in their 30s and 40s that are having to navigate life not only without a manual, as you said, as parents, mm-hmm. but then. Uh, being so inundated with information from social media and from the news and, you know, people telling them how to constantly, how they should be as a parent and turning on Instagram and TikTok and, and seeing videos of, of, of creators making content that looks like this is what a perfect parent looks like. This mm-hmm. is what your body should look like. This is how much money you should have. And it's overwhelming. And, you know, when you Absolutely. were coming up in your career, there, there, there wasn't a LinkedIn. You know, there wasn't mm-hmm. some of these sources today. So there's a lot of young people that are are not trying to, but they're measuring themselves against their peers. And so maybe you are a listener today that has, like Suzanne, in which I want to get into, maybe had a non-traditional path to where you got to. Maybe you switch jobs every few years. And as much as that's exciting, there's also an insecurity that comes with that because it may not feel like your path to success has been as stable as maybe other people. And when you go to LinkedIn and you see colleague, you know, people in your sphere that are doing incredible things and you look at their bio on LinkedIn and it's, you know, they've been at the same job for 10, 15 years and they've moved up in a company and you look at your summary and it's like you were here for a year, then here for six months and two years here, you can feel like, man, do I just not commit to anything or, but sometimes I think it's just a path of, um, kind of taking opportunities as they come, you know, and running with it. And so I think talking about your non-traditional path uh, would be kind of a, a cool next part to go into because you talked about starting off in the grade schools and now you're the president. Congratulations. You are the president of a university. Like what has that journey been like? You know, what are the lessons that you've been learning along the way that could kind of speak life, speak truth, or encourage somebody out there who might feel like their path isn't this straight and narrow path, but it's been this winding, ever-changing. Like, what has that journey been like for you personally? Oh, it's such a good setup, Steve. And and maybe to break down some myths that lots of folks might have, my path has not been straight. My path has not been easy. I've dealt with a fair bit of ambiguity at times and the unknown And yes, it can be overwhelming and it can be frightening. And I think that it's okay to wrestle with those items. I really feel strongly that we should take the pressure off of ourselves to like chart that perfect path or say like, I have my 10 year plan. I think that my journey has been more about being focused on doing good work with people and making a difference in that work and thinking about each day as a new opportunity to solve something, to create something, to make something better for somebody around me. And through that, keeping my eyes very, very wide open to opportunities and keeping my eyes open to what else could we be doing? I think that I have a mindset of continuous improvement. And I also really recognize that I was that senior in college that graduated with not a super clear plan on exactly what I was going to do post-college. And I was feeling a bit like a failure for not, I don't have a 10 year plan. I don't have everything mapped out. And I realized that that isn't really the way my mind works. I'm a very good planner, but I'm really also cognizant of the value that all these other people in the world that I've, that are either members of my family or my husband or my colleagues that I have been so blessed to learn from every single day is a new opportunity to value those voices, to hear things and learn things. And in my mind, if I had 
if I had mapped out a 10 year plan, I might miss some really important opportunities. I might be focusing myself in so narrowly that I might be, I might forget to pick my head up and look around this amazing world and say, there is so much in this world. What, how should I be thinking about that? So I think some things that have helped me navigate a, a little bit of an unusual career trajectory is just is being open and taking a deep breath when I feel those thoughts of anxiety or overwhelmed or, oh my gosh, I don't know how to solve this problem or I don't know what to do about this, to realize that for thousands of years, humans haven't known what to do about a problem. For thousands of years, we've all struggled with, that's where innovation has come through. You know, that's where we, we build things every day. We create things every day. We have science, we have education, we have healthcare, we have the tech, you, you reference the technology industry. Look at the innovation that's happened even in the last 30 years. So I think coming each day with a mindset of not allowing myself to easily fall into a status of being overwhelmed, stressed, or having anxiety. And I'm not suggesting it's easy to put all those feelings aside, but to say, okay, what can I do about this? How, what step forward could I take? And I think I've developed, thank God, for so many amazing people over the course of my life and lots of good reading. I think I have some have developed some very specific go-to strategies that help me when I'm in those moments of I'm in a new job, it's overwhelming, I'm not sure how to be successful, there's a lot of pressure on. I have some go-to strategies that I use time and time and time again that have been very effective and they've allowed me to feel confident to tackle new opportunities and new jobs and new strategies. And for me, Steve, it has never, ever been about, I never had this vision of like climbing a career ladder. I never had a plan. I wanted to do cool things with cool people and I wanted to be challenged. And I knew that there was going to be a struggle in that challenge. And I knew that there was going to be some hardship in that challenge, but I really felt like that was important for me as a human to be able to give back to the world around me. Hey everyone, Steve Campbell. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, if it's made an impact on you, I would love to take a moment to ask you to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode, but I would also love for you to leave a five-star rating and review. Your ratings and review help other listeners know that this show is worth their time. So thank you so much for tuning into The One Big Thing and let's enjoy the rest of the episode. Well, what a cliffhanger. Suzanne, you just said that you have some real things that you do to help you through and you didn't even go through them. So before I have you do that, because as a podcast creator, um, I'm really impassioned about, I didn't want to just create a show um, to have people come on and be very transparent and talk about the anxiousness, talk about the moments that feel overwhelming. And it's just a therapy session for you and I going back and forth. That. I mean, it helps somebody feel connected, but it doesn't help them get better. I am a mm -hmm. super big person on practical takeaways. So like, let's address problems. Let's be honest about the things that sometimes life is unfair, things happen, but then like, what, what are the practical things that we do? And I think what you just even did, and so get ready because I'm going to come to you with what those things that Suzanne Thompson has figured out. But I think what you've done is allowed people to understand that if you feel anxious, you could be the most successful you've ever been and still feel a level of angst. Because as Allison and I talked about in her episode, as you climb up in the success ranks, it feels more lonely, it feels more isolated, there's mm -hmm. more on your shoulders because there's more expected of you. And it's never just a time that you coast. And I think sometimes, if we're not careful, as parents, as spouses in our business, we go through seasons of life that are challenging. And we kind of tell ourselves as a way of coping with it, when I get through this season, X, mm -hmm. Y, Z, you fill in the blank, or in this next season of life, when this thing happens to me, when my kids are just a little bit older and a little bit more mature, then we'll have more quality family time. When my spouse and I are able to do this, then we'll be more connected to each other. When the, when the pay starts to go up and finances start to increase, then we'll be able to do X, Y, Z. And those are true, but they're also pitfalls if we're not careful because we can, we can convince ourselves that life is going to be better in the next season of life 
and rob the current season that we're in, the opportunities that are presenting itself to us to grow and to be shaped by them. And so when I talk with all of these people, not just you, but musicians and athletes and Peloton instructors, the common theme has been that like life sometimes is really unfair. You get thrown curveballs that you never expected, but it's more so what you do with those situations, which makes some people, when you look back, seem like, man, how did you crush life the way that you did? And then there's other people that are just victims the rest of their life. And so what I think is really um, exciting about your story, and before you get into the practical things, uh, for your fans that are coming on, or if you're just new to the One Big Thing podcast, um, I love this show. Uh, this has become such a fun outlet for me. I believe in it and I could use your help. If you are a fan of Suzanne's or you're new to the show and you're an Apple listener, um, would you be willing to go and subscribe to the show on Apple, but also just leave a written review and rating? Um, the reason that's important if you're somebody like me as a podcaster is Apple looks at those things and chooses to promote certain shows based on the feedback that they receive from listeners. So if you want to support her, but also support the show, I would love for you to go on, subscribe, share this with a connection, but also leave a rating and review because you're going to get the insights that Suzanne's about to go into that maybe you don't get on other podcasts. So you had just prefaced a couple minutes ago that there are some real things that you've done in these seasons of life to kind of work through them. Why don't you start to kind of walk us through what some of those are and we'll kind of take them one piece at a time. And I might ask some follow-up questions as you go through them. Oh, awesome. I am super excited to share. And I'm curious to keep listening to your podcast and keep hearing the great insights from, from other guests as well, too. So let's go, let's get practical. So a couple things that I do every single day that are habits and routines that are always helpful to me. And they are pretty darn simple, which I like. I like keeping things simple. So one of the things that I do every day is I start by making sure I'm taking a deep breath. That might sound simple, but it does a lot to sort of loosen my mind and my thoughts and help me feel confident in being able to tackle to your good point, whatever comes at me this day, which might be the plan I have set up for the day, or it might not be the plan I have set out for the day. The other thing I do when I'm thinking about, I've got a scope of work to tackle, I've got a problem to tackle, or I've got a big project coming up. One of the very first things I do is I take 25 minutes and I focus. If you're not a fan of the Pomodoro technique, I would encourage anybody to look at the Pomodoro technique. I think it's been a fantastic technique for me. I believe that when our minds and when we give ourselves the ability to have our minds focus, we actually can accomplish anything we need to do in a fraction of the time that we need to do it. I think that in the world we live in today, Time is also a challenge. We wrestle with time constantly as parents, as adults, as children, as workers. And in my opinion, time is the one thing that doesn't change. Time is a constant variable every single day. So it's all about how I use that time. It's time is not the problem. If I'm if I'm having a problem, it's probably me. So I focus for 25 minutes every morning. And I use that time period to say to myself, what are the three things that I want to accomplish today that if I don't accomplish today, I'm going to like feel bummed at the end of the day about. And sometimes those three things are totally related to my personal life. Sometimes those three things are totally related to my professional life. Sometimes those three things are a combination of my personal and professional life. But doing that for me every day allows me to be clear about how I want to present myself, how I want to think about my day, and how I want to think about being productive. So I start my day every morning doing that, and it's very purposeful. I don't use more than 25 minutes, and I actually set a timer. 
little timer on my cell phone, set the 25 minutes, and I don't pay attention to anything else during that time period. I don't have notifications going off. My phone isn't ringing during that time period. I have nothing that's distracting my mind during that time period. And it allows me to really think deeply. And here's what's hap- what happens over those 25 minutes. I start with the three things that I want to accomplish and I want to feel good about for the day. And then I say, but is that really what will make me feel good at the end of the day? That little brain exercise allows me to be very clear and honest with myself about one what can I accomplish during the day? What is going to be meaningful? What is going to make the biggest impact on my organization, my employees, my colleagues, my clients during that day? And what's going to have the most benefit to me or my family during that day in order to allow me to bring my best self to the table every day for my job or my family or my friends? So that 25-minute focus strategy, and that is what I use first thing in the morning, and I, I don't stop using that strategy over the course of the, the day. I use my 25-minute strategy many times throughout a day. And there could be a day where I, I use it once. And then there could be another day where I use it four or five times. There's no, there's no recipe to it. It's about what I need. So when I'm facing a big project and I'm at the start of a big project, and maybe it's a big, hairy project. There's a ton of variables. The timeline is tight. There's a lot of people involved. We, the, the stakes are high. We've got to get a lot accomplished. I start with that 25 minute focus period and say, how do I think about organizing this project? Who do I need to talk to? What are the things that I don't know already? What should I read to increase my knowledge about this project? Who are my experts who know a heck of a lot more about this project or parts and pieces of this project than I do? So who are some of the people that I can count upon as being great thought partners in helping me accomplish something? So I, the reason I use that 25 minutes and I don't think about anything else during that time period other than the very narrow focus that I'm trying to solve for the problem or the project that I'm trying to solve for is that every single time I've done that, Steve, I've found that in 25 minutes, my brain, by allowing my brain to be focused, I'm able to make more progress in that 25 minutes than I am if I spend six hours with distractions and like, like phone calls or beeps happening or, 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 um, you know, text messages coming in. So I, my message around this is giving ourselves the grace to allow ourselves some think time because we are, you said it earlier, there is a huge amount of information in our world today. There is a huge amount of information, facts, media bombarding us every day. And I think we should turn that off for short periods of time and allow our brains to do what our brains are better than almost anything else on this planet is, is to think about how we want to approach something, to think about how we want to tackle something. So though that 25 minute focus period is incredibly important to me. I also sometimes use it in really simple ways. I'm guessing that at times a, a struggle for for everybody listening to the podcast is like, I've got thousands of emails. How do I get through all my emails or how do I get through all my messages? Sometimes I set that timer and say for 25 minutes, I'm going to crank through emails and I'm just going to knock them out. But, but training yourself to focus on one thing during that time period allows you to walk away from that time period feeling crazy productive And I think when we feel productive and we feel like we've solved something or we feel like we've taken care of something, we feel like we can bring our best self to our day. And even if it's like 25 minutes, I'm going to do ironing today. For 25 minutes, I'm going to do meal prep today. For 25 minutes, I'm going to walk on that treadmill today. Or for 25 minutes, I'm going to walk around the block so that I get some exercise. Or for 25 minutes, I'm going to stand and take some deep breaths or for 25 minutes, I'm going to look outside at the sun today, or I'm going to look outside at the trees today. But for 25 minutes, I'm going to allow myself the ability to really focus on something that's important in my life or my industry. Yeah. And I think, I think what you just said is you dropped, you dropped kind of a, uh, a truth bomb in there that time is not the issue. It's probably us. And I think you know, when you're on podcasts, you're here because you want to acquire new information that can help you in your journey. And there's a lot of self-reflection that has to happen, 
you know, I would want listeners of this show to not be blaming things beyond their control that are influencing them, but, but to be really practical and honest about their own life and what they're doing um, so that they can be self-reflective. And if you're listening to the super practical thing that you just shared, which I love, there may be people who might be thinking, you know, Suzanne, how am I supposed to come up with 25 minutes uh, in my life? And maybe you lived, you know, when this episode comes out, we're early into 2024. Uh, we're going to be starting a new year, a lot of life goals, a lot of this is going to be the best year yet, which I'm a total believer and I love that. But then there is also just the reality of, you know, what didn't work in the last year? And if you want to see real life change, then just doing the same thing and expecting a different result is not going to line up for you. And so what are the things that you need to do differently to create change? And it's not that it it costs you something, but you need to realign priorities and you know responsibilities so that your principles match up with who you are as a person. And maybe rather than spending 25 minutes once the kids go down for bed at night, endlessly scrolling Instagram, trying to fill a need in your life that doesn't need to be met. And I'm speaking for myself here, folks. This is for Steve. This is not for anybody else. But if it helps you identify, then please enter in. Rather than spending 25 minutes at night living your life through the lens of what other people are doing, go to bed 25 minutes earlier and set your alarm for 25 minutes earlier the next day so that you can get up. Because I'm sure there's a lot of listeners that are you know, in the thick of life. They're raising kids, they have a family, they're starting a career, they want to get up, they want to get out. But if all you're doing is when that alarm goes off, hopping in the shower, making coffee, getting dressed and going on and doing your day, there is a fundamental truth to warming your your brain up, warming your soul up, becoming in tune with the day. You know, many of many of us grew up playing sports. You didn't just show up at a field and just start running. You know, you spent time uh, warming up your muscles. Uh, it's funny how you said this is such a simple, practical thing, but we don't think about that all the time. We just do life. We just we constantly react to life as it happens. What my goal is as the host is to help you move from a place of reacting to being ready, being prepared, and being proactive for how you approach every day. And if the only thing that you heard from Suzanne today is that time is not the problem, it's probably something that we're doing. There's a truth to that. Whether that's hard to digest or not is up to you. But if that's the reality of, you know what, she's absolutely right. Well, then now here's a super practical thing you can do in 25 minute increments to start to align your life and prioritize. Like, what do you need to do today? And I think that's the hard part, right? As somebody who is in a little over their mid thirties, you know, you have these high water marks age wise uh, that we're all going through. You know, when you reach 25, when you reach 30, when you reach 35, when you reach 40, in these times when a birthday comes or a really sober reminder that you're getting older and that time is moving faster or so it seems, but it's still constant. Life moves faster because you're also living it through the life of your kids who are getting older, your mm -hmm. parents who are getting older. I, I know for me, I've struggled with the fact of I don't feel older than when I was 18. My body feels older, but I, I still like have this like weird sense of like, I don't know if I'm made out. Like, why do people listen to me? Like, why, why I can't make these decisions. Like I need like my parents to make this decision. And then it's like, wait, I'm 37 years old and I have four children. And like, I, I say this all the time and I don't mean it jokingly, but when father's day comes around and people are like, Steve, happy father's day. I'm kind of like, what? They're like, happy father's day. I'm like, no, that's my dad. Like my dad gets a father's day. I'm like, and, and you like, so time is fascinating because it seems like it never ends, yet it goes too fast. You never have a proper understanding of where you fit within time. And it can seem like seasons go on forever. But then in a the blink of an eye, you look back over the last 10 years in the seasons of life that you were stuck in that you felt would never end. Now you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, that wasn't so bad. And so even just if the only thing that this does is give you a 25 minute increment that you can you know, begin to look at, that you can begin to implement in your life, well, then job well done. And so I don't know if there's anything without um, with, within this confines that you were talking about that you think would be helpful to explore or any other um, things that you practically do, because I think what you just shared was was really insightful for people that have never thought of such a simple exercise before. Yeah, I love the way you talked about time as a resource, because I think we do need to think about time as a resource. Water is a resource. Fuel is a resource. Food is a resource for us. There are resources and tools all around us as humans, and we have an endless capacity 
about how to use those resources really, really well as a society. We can use our resources poorly, but we can choose to use our resources poorly, or we can choose to use our resources well. And a part of what I'm grateful to have learned over the course of my lifetime from many amazing people and sometimes some hard lessons are how do I ensure that I choose to use the resources that I have available to me really, really well? And you made a great point about the fact that we are not in control of everything that happens to us every day. That's okay. But the things that I do have control over, how do I ensure that I'm maximizing that those timeframes that I do have the ability to use those resources wisely? So for me, time is a resource. How do I ensure that each day that I'm using my time really wisely? I also think like water, time is precious. It's absolutely precious because it does go by and the seasons of our life do change. So how are we using our time in ways that give us joy, in ways that help us advance ourselves as individuals, in ways that help us um, help our families? And so I really love that 25 minute time frame because it forces my mind to focus. Another technique that my husband and I started doing many, many years ago that was a innovation off of this 25 minute time period is that the 25 minute time period helps me get through some really short term pieces, like helps me get through a day or helps me think about a project or helps me think about a scope of work that I want to get accomplished. But I also think there are those critical times where we do want to think about, and I love the way you framed this, Steve, is we're coming up on the end of 2023 and we're about to come into a brand new year. So this is a time of year when a lot of people all around the world start to reflect and they think about, what do I want this new year to look like for myself? So the little innovation that my husband and I created together from this 25 minute increment is we sit down with each other at least once a month, but we always do it more intentionally between Christmas and New Year's every year. We sit down and we make sure we have like two hours. There's no phone calls. There's no text messages. There's no distraction. And we usually do it over a cup of coffee or maybe a cocktail in the evenings. And we look at each other and say, where, where do we want to see ourselves in the next three months or six months? Or where do we want to be as a couple or as a family or as a career? We're great um, communicators to support each other's dreams and goals. And we intentionally have a conversation about that. What do we want to accomplish? And because we do it together, one, I think it's a lot more fun. And you could do this with a best friend. You could do it with a parent. You could do it with a colleague. So it's a lot of fun and it allows, we kind of push each other to think more deeply about some of those bigger rocks or those bigger goals in life and how we want to accomplish that. We also do a great job of holding each other accountable if we are trying to tackle way more than is humanly possible. And we're also great at supporting each other to be able to accomplish those goals. I love doing that with my colleagues here at work you know, let's be reflective. You know, what are the things that we're so proud of in 2023 as an organization? What are those things that were really benchmarks of accomplishment? And what are those things that we are want to think about in terms of improvement next year? Not through the lens of what did we fail at or what did we not get to, but what do we want to build upon? What are the areas that we want to double down on and improve upon? So I think taking that 25 minute strategy and then building it out into a, all right, we're going to be really decisive about saying we're going to take a two hour time period, doing it personally or professionally and saying, what are some of those big focus areas that we think are really important in the coming year? In the field of education, some of those big focus areas for myself and my colleagues across our university next year are How do we keep supporting career changers? There are more and more people coming into education that are recognizing maybe after 15 or 20 or 25 years in their career, hey, I think I want to get engaged in education. And so we want to think about how do we support those individuals? How do we help career changers think about what does it feel like to be a teacher? What does it feel like to be in the industry? How can we be innovative in the way that we think about embracing people 
who are coming to us with incredible content knowledge, life experience, work experience, and they've got experience outside of education. And as educators, we need to be open to that. Somebody's coming into our system who can bring new skills, new innovation, new ideas. Maybe they're a marketer. Maybe they're a scientist. Maybe they're a researcher. You know, maybe they've been a pastor their whole career. You know, how can we? So, so we're super excited about some of the, those big goals and the way we think about those are, are saying, let's dedicate some time to thinking about some of those big goals and big focus areas. Um, so clarity and focus are a big part of my work as well. And I think things that have helped me be successful is like, what are we going to focus on? What are those three big things that we're going to focus on? In my 25 minutes, What I use a rule of three all the time. I don't know that there's any science behind it. It just works for me. And it feels like three things are, are doable. Um, and if I start to make a list of 10 or 15, I'm probably getting carried away. It's probably not going to be super successful. So I give myself three and my colleagues all around me know like, oh, Suzanne will probably say rule of three. Um, and I'm sure that I learned that from somebody smarter than me along the way. So using time as a resource and focusing on what are those three things? And maybe it's in Q1. What are those three things we really want to accomplish in Q1 that's going to help our clients, our partners, our customers be more effective? What are those three things in Q1 that are going to help us feel better about ourselves? What are those three things in Q1 that's going to help our family feel better about ourselves as family? So 25 minutes could expand into two hours. And what are those three things? And, and how can you focus your energy around them to feel a sense of accomplishment and to feel a sense of pride, to feel a sense of success, to feel like you've done meaningful work on yourself or in your family, or in your marriage, or in your job. Um, so those are some of the little things that I, I like to use and apply that are that are super simple. Suzanne, you came to you came to came to party today. I mean, the, the, it's <laughs> it's um it's super practical. And I think from what I just heard is maybe where the struggle or distinction breaks down is that there's a difference between time and timing. And so the two things that you just laid out is that you want to be very protective of your time to allot the right amount of time to fix your mind, fix your priorities, um, do the things that are important to you so that you can uh, be focused and have principles. And I think what that does is when you set that time aside to identify those things, it also creates for you core convictions and principles. And maybe where a lot of people struggle is they don't even know what they stand for or what they mm -hmm. value. So so the media, the news is constantly dictating to them what they should value and what they should believe in. And there's this like confusion of like, when you have convictions and you know, and I love the rule of three, when I have three things that I, that I really need to accomplish today, then anything else that is going to subverge that or get in the way, you don't be a jerk about it, but it allows you to at least have the grace to tell somebody else like, hey, I would love to do that. I got to get this done today. Can we put some time on the calendar to do that? So you're not just saying no. And this was a conversation that, again, if you're new to the show, I had a conversation with a good friend I grew up with, Peter Engler, where we talked about a lot about conflict and conflict resolution. Mm. And I think it's never been easier in a digital age and just miss expectations to have conflict arise from, from the components of time, not knowing what we stand for but then also timing. If you come to this podcast today and you listen to Suzanne and you take what she says and you get revved up and you want to go immediately because Suzanne meets with her husband during the Christmas holiday season and sits down to create accountability and you're like, I need to do that right now. And you go to your spouse who's been with kids all day long or been at an office and doing stuff and they did not listen to the one big thing, which I, which I would encourage them to go do. Um, but you've received information that you find valuable. So now you come to the person you love or you do life with and you're like, hey, we need to do this. And they're, they're not in the mental space to even understand what you're yeah. talking about. It's a timing issue. You have something, but what happens is you present an idea for creating life change to somebody else who hasn't received what you have and their reception of it is not the expectation or the experience that you were hoping for. And the next thing you know, you're like, Hey, I'm just, I'm trying to make us better this year, babe. Like I'm, I'm trying to get us on the same page. And they're like, I don't have time for this right now. You can, yeah. you can create marital conflict by not understanding the flow of timing in life. 
And I think, man, if we can, if we can figure that out, like I get excited. I, I'm a person that, man, when something good happens, I want to tell everybody. And so what I found is a place of frustration is something happens with you, Suzanne. I have this incredible life altering conversation and then I get done. And the first thing I want to do is I want to call my wife and she's with my kids right now. And so I'm going to call her and who knows what those kids have been doing, but I'm like, Hey, Oh my gosh, podcast with Suzanne was incredible. And she's like, okay, great. And it seems like she's not interested. She is interested because she's my best Mm -hmm. friend, but she's just not in the space to be able to understand what I'm talking about. What would be better is for me to learn from those experiences and say, there is a set time that I need to share with her how my day went. And so I wonder how many couples struggle with conflict because of timing issues, Mm. not being able to set aside time. And that's what I love about what you did. You know, when you're in the thick of this life, which I've been describing this entire time, you are trying to navigate the different layers. And I've talked about this on other shows. When you are a parent, you have children, which is a layer. You have a spouse, which is a layer. And then you have yourself. What happens is those three layers all kind to get mishmash together in, in what you're trying to do is go from one moment to the next, being super distracted, trying to figure out big life situations and never actually accomplishing much of anything. And mm-hmm. so, you know, you just get your kids to bed and then you're like, how am I going to be a better parent? And you're trying to figure that out. And you've never given yourself the space to like decompress, to step back and to give yourself the grace and the ability to say, this is my set time, my 25 minutes to talk. And not, I'm not going to text you during the day and say, Suzanne, we got to talk. That's folks, that's not, let's drop that in 2024. That is not helpful. But, but be meaningful with your time. If you do life with another person, or this could be a colleague or a business partner or whoever, if there are things that are important to you, set the time aside to really think through that so you can prioritize what needs to be done, but then recognize that the delivery as much as a timing issue as anything. So you just don't drop the ball that you're ready to have a conversation that maybe somebody else isn't ready for and it's ill-received, which makes you think that they don't care. What if we were able to navigate some of those things that you just talked about? And so just just learning how to recognize that I think is really key for a lot of us. And it kind of goes into the theme that I've been hearing from you um, and you've been rocking so far is that you're a problem solver. And I got to imagine that a lot of the opportunities that you've been given in your life is because you have recognized a problem, whether that's at an academic level, a community level, even within your marriage, what have you, you're probably somebody who just sees something that isn't working and probably doesn't just from what I'm gathering from you, you don't just chalk chalk it up through your hands in the air and go, well, that's my husband's thing to figure out, or that's my staff's job to figure out. I have to imagine you're the kind of person that recognizes something that's going on and then probably begins to either work on finding solutions, which could be incorporating team members, strengths, abilities. What do you see perspectives? And, and that's kind of what I'm picking up from you is that I wonder, you talked about air, you talked about water being resources. There's just resources and people that are in our life. And so there's Maybe people that are out there today feeling stuck, feeling isolated, feeling like nobody hears them. Maybe Mm -hmm. you have not been tapping into the resources of people that are around you to, again, set that time aside, talk with a friend and say, look, these are the goals that I have. This is what I'm working on. Is there anything that you think, you know, that I'm missing or that I should share? You'd be surprised at colleagues, friends, what have you that are willing to share apps, uh, life hacks, books resources because you gave them permission to enter into the thing that you're trying to do. Otherwise you're just running full speed ahead, knocking everybody over, you know, everybody over in your path, wondering why nobody gets you, nobody sees you, nobody feels it. And so from your story, is there anything, you know, as we kind of bring this episode to a close in the world of problem solving, like you can't solve everything. Sometimes things are beyond your control, but what do you think in your either personal or professional journey when it comes to recognizing problems, what's been a good starting point for maybe that listener that like see something is going wrong in the office or in their household is going wrong? Like what are the, what are the initial steps you can begin to take in, in regards to solving a problem? Oh, such a good question, Steve. Thank you so much. I I think there's a couple very concrete steps that I do. One, when I see a problem, I immediately choose to take a very neutral mindset around that problem. I don't judge it as good. I don't judge it as bad. I almost try to put my engineering hat on and say, hmm, 
or my curiosity. If I look at the problem through a lens of curiosity rather than a lens of judging and say, okay, we've got a problem. Let's learn something about this problem. So I might spend 25 minutes because I don't know a lot about this problem. So I might set aside 25 minutes and I'm going to read everything I can about this problem to try to educate myself and learn a little bit. Notice that I did not say I'm going to spend three days or six hours because like many of your listeners, I don't have three days. I, I don't have six hours, but I know I can do something and take action in a very focused way for 25 minutes. I know that's manageable in my day. So I might start with saying, I'm going to learn a little bit about this problem. I want to study a little bit. I don't know much about this. So I, I think I need to read some things. The other thing I might do, which I would encourage anybody who's feeling isolated or you're feeling alone in whatever situation you're in, whether it's your personal life or your professional life, pick up the phone or walk down the hall and say, hey, I'm feeling stuck. I'm feeling stuck on this. I ha There's this problem that I'm looking at, and it might be in my life or it might be in my work, and I'm feeling stuck on the problem. And I would like to tell you about the problem, and I would like you to put on your thinking hat to help me sort of think through this problem. I think we spend way more time being afraid to pick up that phone or being afraid to walk down that hallway. And therefore we waste that precious resource of time when every single time I have never run into a human being that hasn't been helpful. And I mean, human beings all over the world of all different cultures and all different languages. I've never run into a time where when I say to somebody, hey, could we spend 25 minutes? I'm like stuck on this right now. Can I talk to you about this? And could you like reflect with me and tell me what you're thinking about it? Every single time I have done that, I have gotten brilliant insights. I've gotten empathy. I've gotten ideas, or I've gotten that person to say, we should talk to this person, or you should read this, or I have an answer over here. So again, it's kind of coming back to some things that are a little bit simple. It's choosing to focus for a short period of time to be able to take action on whatever it is I, I need to take action on. Because you, you made the point well earlier, we are bombarded with information in this world, which is, I think, really hard. I think there's so many voices, there's so much information coming at us. And when we give ourselves a little bit of space and focus to just focus on that one thing or to focus on that one problem, to read a little bit, to learn a little bit, to explore or call someone and say, I'm stuck, we begin to immediately sort of loosen up the problem. We begin to find ways to solve things. We begin to find solutions. We begin to make connections with people. And the minute you start to do that through a lens of curiosity and a lens of wanting to take action and wanting to go forward and wanting to people wanting people to feel a sense of inspiration and a sense of success in the problem solving effort we don't have to look at problems as negatives we don't have to look at problems as downers we don't have to look at problems as anchors in our lives problems are reality of life on planet earth. And if we look at problems through the lens of curiosity or engineering a solution and finding time to focus, I absolutely believe as human beings and our capabilities, our interconnectedness, we can solve every single problem that comes about. We can't always do it ourselves. We can't always do it today. We might have to do it tomorrow or it might take several days or it might take several months or it might take several years. But it's about taking those first steps to focus, find some clarity, learn a little bit, upskill yourself, upskill your colleagues and talk to people. Pick up that phone and call someone and say, I'm stuck on this. And I think you'll immediate if you try that simple technique you'll immediately feel a sense of relief by who you can tap into who might be a great who has has great insight into being able to help you think through something more clearly 
I love that. And I'm going to give you uh, time here to start thinking through your start, stop, continue as I kind of bring this uh, episode uh, home, if you will. I think what you just shared, um, which I think is really important for myself and every listener, no one is going to know the things that you are going through are struggling with unless you express it to them. I think there's a lot of people that are hoping that someone else is going to just be aware that they're struggling and like say something to them. And yeah, every once in a while that may happen. It could be with your spouse that you're just hoping that they're going to pick up on, you know, your your mood or attitude. And that's not fair to them. You're going to hope that colleagues are going to understand that you're under a lot of stress and pressure. There's a difference between like you complain all the time to people so they're aware that you're going through stuff versus just carrying this weight all the time and expecting other people to recognize it versus I think what you just said, which is recognizing the people around you, having empathy, being transparent, being open and honest, and and being willing to, to not complain, but come to somebody and say, I feel a little stuck. I'm not really sure what to do with this. And I think you would be pleasantly surprised. And obviously you have to go to the right person and the right source. So don't just be foolish with this. But if you will really in full timing too, timing, don't catch them at a wrong time and you know, like what we just talked about. But if you'll be really open with people and say like, hey, this is an area in my professional life that I'm struggling with, or, you know, my personal life, is there anything that you think that I'm missing or I'm not seeing or that I should look at? I think you'd be pleasantly surprised how many people are willing to help you because at the end of the day, it is easier to help other people than it is yourself. We are the hardest ones self-wise to make right. Um, I may know that I need to eat better, take care of myself, get to the gym and do all of that. It's a matter of actually doing it. If I saw you and I was trying to champion you, it is so much easier for me to give emotional bandwidth to you and be like, Suzanne, come on, we got to do this. You got to get out there. You got to go train because it's not you. So I think that this episode was powerful. Uh, I think it was super practical, which I appreciate. And um, I think for being my first educator, you absolutely nailed it. But again, if you are new to the one big thing, I always conclude every show with a segment that I call Start, Stop, Continue. I found that this is just a really fun way to get to know our guests uh, in maybe a way that if you've never resonated with their story or you know, maybe there are some aspects to the show that you're like, I don't really get it or it wasn't for me. I think this ending is always super helpful. So Start, Stop, Continue. I asked my guests to come up with one one thing they want to start doing, one thing that they want to stop doing, and one thing that they want to continue doing it. Um, so Suzanne, what you can do is whatever order you want to go in, just give us whatever the action is, followed up by whatever it is you want to work on, and then we'll bring this episode to a close. Oh, it sounds like an awesome plan. Thank you so much, Steve. So something that I am excited about starting to do is that I don't often give myself time during the day to just take a few minutes to relax. I'm pretty task oriented. I'm pretty focused on my work. My days are really full. And it dawned on me that I should be using my time technique to find a little space to just do something that I want to do. And I use my, I'm going to do my my timing technique. So I'm going to set a timer for myself and I'm probably going to start small. I'm probably going to set a timer for 15 minutes and say, I'm just going to do some fun for me for that 15 minutes, or maybe I'll set it for 25. And it could be um, reading something. It could be taking a walk. It could be, it could be searching online for a a beautiful sweater that I think I need. It's something that's just really something I want to do, but I don't do a good job of that currently. So I'm going to start using my little timing technique and each day set aside 15 minutes of like, what do I want to do? Like something that's really for myself. I think we don't do a good job of taking care of ourselves often um, as people. So just just doing that. I'm going to start doing that. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, The one thing that I want to stop doing is that I want to be sure that I am never feeling like I'm racing through the day. Um, And some of the techniques I use are really, really helpful in that regards, but I'm going to take away the wisdom from all the podcasts that I've listened from you and some of the other guests. And I'm going to start thinking more about how do I, I 
end my day and and because I, I start my day really meaningfully. But I love I, I think I'm going to stop ending my day feeling like I just kind of am exhausted or I race through the day. But how do I apply some of the techniques at the beginning of my day to my, the end of my day and feeling focused or feeling a sense of peace in the in, in at, at the end of the day? So I'm going to stop um, feeling like I'm racing through the day or, or feeling um, or thinking about my days that way. Something that I am definitely going to continue doing because it has worked for, I won't say 50 how many years, but I am going to keep time blocking. I'm going to keep thinking about time as a precious resource and how do I keep using time really effectively each and every day, um, not through the lens of my to-do list, but through the lens of focus and connections with the amazing people that are on planet Earth around me and how do I keep making a difference in myself, my family, and the lives of my colleagues and the work that we do. And I'm going to continue to think about problems through the lens of curiosity and boldness and joy. Um, and these are things that we have the capabilities to do together as humans. And I think when we take a positive approach, so I'm going to keep taking that positive approach to problem solving and keep taking a step forward every single day. Well, I love the honesty and transparency because I know that that's something that also resonates with me. Um, it's easy for me to get up in the morning before my kids get up, get to the gym, come back, have some devotional time, get my mind right. I do great, you know, before 7 p.m. at night. And then mm -hmm. there's just something about the end of the day, getting kids to bed, that transition where I struggle. Um, my guard's down mentally. It's tough. So just even you sharing that, um, it's not just you, it's myself. It may be other people, but I think that this was a, um, just beautiful conversation today that maybe we delved into some things that we didn't know we'd get into. Hopefully uh, people that know you and love you really appreciate it. Kind of hearing more of your story for those that have never got to know you. We will have some information in the show notes uh, if they want to connect with you anyway, or get to know you more that they can do that. Uh, but uh, Suzanne, you were incredible. Uh, thank you for being a guest. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. Thank you for the valuable insights that I think are extremely practical if you want to apply them. Um, but as always, we hope that the uh, one big thing is just one show that will help you move the ball forward in your life to really become the best version of yourself that I know you know exists. Maybe we just got to get some stinking thinking and some other things out of the way. So use Suzanne's uh, practical insights to help you. But uh, as always, thanks for being my guest. It was amazing being here, Steve. A huge honor. I'm super pumped to have been able to do this. And uh, I learned a lot from you today. So thank you so much for that. <laughs>